It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold. Peace on the earth to all good will, from heaven the news we bring. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Still through the cold and stars they call with peaceful wings unfurled. And still their heavenly music floats o'er all the weary world. Above its sad and lonely plains they bend on hovering wing, and ever o'er its battle sounds the blessed angels sing. But with the woes of war and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the angel strain have rolled two thousand years of wrong. And we who fight the wars hear not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise of battle strife, and hear the angels sing. For lo, the days are hastening on by prophet voice untold. When with the ever-circling years comes round the age of gold, when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors swing, and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing. Yet here 
light and joy burns new a fiery gem the heart is tired at Bethlehem no human dream on broken stands yet here God comes to mortal hands and hope renewed cries out Good morning. We ring our bell three times. The first chime I associate with Caspar. In medieval tradition, a king of India and the oldest of the Magi visiting infant Jesus. He represents those who came before us, our lines of genetic ancestors, our many spiritual ancestors, and the Muwekma Ohlone, from whom this land, the land of this Mission Peak region was taken. The second chime I associate with Melchior, traditionally king of Persia and of intermediate age. He represents those of us gathered this morning and all of humanity presently alive seeking to learn from the past, plan for the future, and act in the present. The third chime I associate with Balthazar, traditionally an African king and the youngest in age. He represents the 200 million generations which I calculate could live on earth before the sun becomes a red giant, provided we avoid mutual destruction and instead follow the path of truth and love. Custom which brings us here together in the presence of the Most High to face our ideals to remember our loved ones in absence, to give thanks, to make confession, to offer forgiveness, to be enlightened, to be strengthened through this quiet hour. Through this hour, 
breathes the worship of the ages, the cathedral music of history. Three unseen guests attend, faith, hope, and love. Let us all offer our hearts to prepare them place. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Mission Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Eric Ryan, and I'm a member of the board. We are so glad you've joined us this morning. Unitarianism Universalism is a radically inclusive, non-doctrinal, non-dogmatic, open-minded, and open-hearted faith. We are people who are coming at truth from different paths. We gather together across different identities, different experiences, and beliefs to affirm and promote the inherent worth of every person. Together, we see our job to love the hate out of the world, heal the hurt in ourselves and one another, and to be the change we'd like to see in the world. We use the chat and Zoom and the book by the door to share joys and concerns, personal milestones of importance that we read around during the service. Please feel free to participate in this. Maybe you're here for the first time. We've been reaching out and asking people to bring friends because we think the world, especially now, needs some friendly places for people to gather and find encouragement and hope. We will have a soul shower after the service, where we get to visit with one another in breakout rooms or on the patio. The worship host will give you more information about this immediately after the service. In the meantime, note the link to our weekly newsletter in the chat so you can see all the events that are coming up. We encourage you to participate in anything that speaks to you. You can also use our welcome email, welcome at mpuuc.org, to request a newsletter or other information to be sent to you. In-person attendees should be masked inside and outside Cole Hall during the service. Because it is becoming apparent that vaccinated people can spread the disease to others, especially during the Omicron wave, we strongly encourage those in contact with children and unvaccinated or immunocompromised adults to attend services outside or via Zoom, as I am doing. We allow worship leaders, associates, and other service participants to be unmasked while speaking if they voluntarily disclose they are vaccinated and are 10 feet apart from others. More information and other announcements can be found in the bulletin board to your left for those in, per in person and in This Week on the Peak, our newsletter and in the order of service. Those of you in person, please silence your electronic devices. If you hear or see something in this morning's service that inspires you or makes you laugh or brings you hope, please tweet it, share it, on social media, or just tell a friend. Again, thank you for joining us. We have been celebrating the birth of a child, but birth is just a beginning and a child is just one person. This morning we seek to step forward from that beginning and to acknowledge what is around the child and to look forward to a vision for humanity. Please join Sharon Davis and Joanne Schreiner to sing All Around the Child.
Life from love once more Universal miracle Faith in life restore The harmony of all the world Lost the newborn child to rest Welcome dreamers Please join with me in reciting these words, which calls us together as a community and with Unitarian Universalists across the globe. We light this chalice to remind ourselves, treat all people kindly because we are all one family to take good care of the earth because it is our home, to live lives full of goodness and love because that is how we will become the best people we can be. One of our sources, the sources of our faith, is the words and deeds of prophetic men and women that challenge us to comfort powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. The story that you're about to hear is about one such prophetic man, John Lewis, who died last year. It is told by the Reverend Karen Johnston. This true story comes to us from John Lewis, a great leader in this nation who died just last month. Many people were sad to lose him and thankful for all the things that he had done to bring about justice and fairness in our nation. He had lived a long and full life asking of himself and asking of all of us to show up for justice, to do what we can and just a little bit more to make sure that there is more fairness in our country. When he was 23 years old, he spoke at the March on Washington with Dr. King. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. John Lewis grew up in a large family and he would spend time with his aunts and uncles, with his siblings and cousins. There were many children who lived in the neighborhood and they would play together.
this was long before there was a pandemic. And so people could play together and hang out together in person. Mr. Lewis tells us about a time when he was playing outside his aunt Senevia's house with about 14 other children when a storm, a big storm, arrived. A kind of storm that made him and everyone else afraid. I'm going to tell a story from his perspective. So it's like him talking. So when I say I, it really means John. Ansonevia was the only adult around and as the sky blackened and the wind grew stronger, she herded us all inside. Her house was not the biggest place around and it seemed even smaller with so many children squeezed inside. Small and surprisingly quiet, all of the shouting and laughter that had been going on earlier outside had stopped. The wind was howling now and the house was starting to shake and we were scared. Even Aunt Senevia was scared. And then it got worse. Now the house was beginning to sway and the wood plank flooring beneath us began to bend and then a corner of the house began lifting up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. This storm was actually pulling the house towards the sky with us in it. That was when Aunt Zenevia told us to clasp hands. Line up and hold hands, she said, and we did as we were told. And then she had us walk as a group towards the corner of the room that was rising from the kitchen to the front of the house we walked and the wind was screaming outside and sheets of rain were beating on a, the tin roof. And we walked back in the other direction as another end of the house began to lift. And so it went back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weight of our small bodies. Can you imagine what it was like to have been inside that house? Afraid that it might fall apart from the destructive force of the wind and the rain from the whole storm? I'm so glad that John Lewis wasn't alone, that no one there was alone, that he was with his friends and family. I'm so glad that together they figured out a way to save the house, to save their home. When John Lewis was much older, just not that long before he died, he was writing down the story of his whole astounding life and he wrote these words. More than half a century has passed since that day and it has struck me more than once over the many years that our society is not unlike the children in that house, rocked again and again, the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seemingly like they're going to fly apart. It seemed that way in the 1960s at the height of the civil rights movement when America itself felt as if it might burst at the seams, so much tension, so many storms. But the people of conscience never left the house. They never ran away. They stayed, they came together, and they did the best they could, clasping hands and moving towards the corner of the house that was the weakest. And then another corner would lift, and we would go there. And eventually, inevitably, the storm would subside and the house would stand.
but we knew another storm would come and we would have to do it all over again. And we did. And we still do, all of us, you and I, children holding hands, walking with the wind. Thank you for listening, not really to my story, but to Mr. John Lewis's story. This reading is selected from the second chapter of the first gospel, which tradition calls Matthew's, but whose author is actually unknown. I am reading from the New King James Version, but I've restored one word from the original Greek. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. They departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As you know, every year the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee guest at your table program connects us with people working in partner organizations around the world. They help inform us about real people experiencing critical human rights violations. We then have the opportunity to invite these folks to our table and imagine how using our UU principles we can make a difference in the world. This morning, we're highlighting UUSC's partner, the Kiowa Island Community Organization, or KIKO, which is an organization supporting the island on Fiji to become more climate resilient. Around the world, indigenous communities are facing the harshest and earliest impacts of climate change. As a result of rising seas, melting permafrost, and other impacts of climate crisis, which they did little to create, indigenous communities are at risk of having to relocate from their ancestral homelands where they have lived for between hundreds and thousands of years. Let's hear from one of Kiko's leaders about their important work. The Kiowa Island Community Organization, or Kiko, is the only non-governmental organization established and led by the people of Kiowa Island in the Pacific. In the face of climate change, Kiko is helping prepare the people of Kiowa to be more climate resilient and ensure sufficient food is available if people from lower-lying islands are forced to relocate 
tukio wa higher ground kiko is doing this through the strategic plan community tree planting and training community members in agro farming which help yield climate tolerant crops and cleaner water our hope for the future is to improve standards of living and secure a resilient future for the gener generation to come. We want to thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you for inviting these justice partners to be guests at your table. These conversations turn into actual support and justice. Thank you. We come together every Sunday and throughout the week for more than ourselves. We come to support one another and the ministries that infuse worth and dignity in our children and youth and our programs of learning and worship and our ministries in the larger world, including our effort towards anti-racism and anti-oppression. Please make a contribution towards these worthy causes by mailing your check to Mission Peak UU Congregation at the address on the screen. You can also use the bill pay option on your online banking or drop a check in Mission Peak mail slot or pay online or with a debit or credit card. Thank you for supporting and sustaining the efforts and members of our friends and staff. Your contributions make loving, learning, and leadership more possible. things that allows us to find hope and meaning, especially in the hard times, the love and support we show one another. If you have a joy or concern that by sharing it with this community might bring encouragement and resilience that you are needing, please write it now briefly in the chat. If you're here in person and would like to place a stone for joy and concern, you may do it while the music plays. If your need is personal, you can also send an email to our minister for a follow-up conversation. Oh, 
share the joys and concerns written in our book. And we have one item that was written by Don Ramey. A joy, the wonderful long days of family gathered from afar. And now Paul will read the names that were written in the chat. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank Peggy Rahman for the beautiful rendition of I Wonder As I Wander, in keeping with our monthly theme of wander for our time of acknowledgement of joys, sorrows, and concerns. And uh, Jay Steele agrees with me. Nice singing, Peggy. And in addition says, congrats also to NASA for launching the James Webb Space Telescope. And I would comment, we have 29 days of concern for the Webb Telescope because like a Christmas present, it was launched in parts and will self-assemble in space. And we will see how well that goes. And I believe that is all of our our Zoom acknowledgements. We always place one last stone for the unspoken joys, sorrows, or concerns, and remind everyone that you may contact uh, uh, Reverend Greg or our encouragement committee if you have further concerns that are not appropriate for, uh, for public announcement. Today, the day after Christmas, is the Feast of Stephen in much of the Christian community. For many, it is called Boxing Day. It was a medieval tradition that those whose jobs called on them to serve on Christmas Day, especially the servants of the noble and wealthy, would receive the day after Christmas as a holiday and would be given a bonus, sometimes money, sometimes goods, in a Christmas box. In the song, Good King Wenceslas, the Duke of Bohemia sees a poor man laboring on this day and invites him to dinner. This is a recording of a performance of that song 
by the Center Stage Singers, in which I sang Wenceslas lines and Karthik Raman sang the Pages lines. Well, according to Dolly of the Family Circus comic strip by Bill and Jeff Keen, quote, then the three wise men came to babysit Jesus so Mary and Joseph could finish Christmas shopping, unquote. Such is one of many retold versions of the visit of Magi to infant Jesus. I don't know whether the account in the gospel is true. On the one hand, there is nothing impossible or improbable in the account. On the other hand, we have only one unconfirmed source. I keep an open mind. Dolly is hardly the only one to misrepresent the story. Even the King James translation of the Bible distorts it by translating the word magi as wise men. We have no reason to believe the magi were all male, though a travel group in those days would almost certainly have been mostly male. In other developments of the story, the Magi became kings, and in a rare medieval embrace of diversity, these three kings are often represented as from three different racial groups, one white, one black, one South Asian. The Magi are probably the occasion for associating gift-giving with Christmas. In fact, in many cultures, including, for example, Spain, it is the three kings rather than Santa Claus who bring gifts. Today, however, I am interested not in the truth of the event or its many embellishments, but in why the gospel author chose to include this story. There are four gospels in the Christian New Testament, only one of which incorporates this event. My answer is based on the ancient meaning of the word magi. They were not magicians, as our modern use of the word would imply, nor were they the only persons regarded as wise. They were, in fact, priests of the ancient Zoroastrian religion. I believe the author is letting us know that Christianity developed not just from Judaism, but from other sources as well, including Zoroastrianism. Another time I may talk about the very interesting Zoroastrian religion, perhaps the first belief system to endorse freedom of religion, and yet another time I may talk about how Jesus and early Christianity may have been influenced by Greek philosophy and even Buddhism. Today, I wish merely to praise the concept that a belief system should accept input from other beliefs and provide 
more detail on how Unitarian Universalism officially accepts many sources of truth and good. As Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, let us learn the revelation of all nature and thought. But first, more music. Thank you. The biblical story of the visit of the Magi is quite sparse, but legend has added many details. The number of them was chosen to be three, one for each gift, and they have been elevated and ranked to king. Please sing along with this rendition in which three of the peak performers sing the verses of the kings and others join in on the choruses. We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain moor and mountain following yonder star. O star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, what a sweet meaning still proceeding, guide us to this perfect light. Frankincense to offer have I, incense owns a deity nigh, prayer and praising all are raising, worship God most high. Is mine its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom, soaring, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. Love forever ceasing, never in our hearts to reign. O oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us through this perfect light. Unitarian Universalism accepts truth and good from any source from which it may come. We officially recognize six broad categories of source, and these are listed in our hymnal on the second page before the first hymn. To give a broad overview of these six sources, each of six different people will be presenting, one for each source. First will be Barbara Myers presenting on the first source, which is the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and, the, and uphold life. The first source from which our living tradition draws is the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. Our religious forebears, among them Michael Sergidis, Joseph Priestley, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, went against the religious tide of their times by following and celebrating their own direct experience of the holy, oftentimes to great personal peril. It is this encouragement that our faith gives us as our first source to seek our own sources of truth and to respect and follow where they lead us. The Christian historian Diana Butler Bass reflected that in 1962, pollsters found that just 2% of Americans claimed to have had a mystical experience of God. 
1976, that number had risen to 31% of the population. By 2008, 48%, nearly half of Americans, confessed that they had had a mystical encounter with the divine. If I had been asked, I would have said yes to that question. Bass asks, what if this trend was the first stirrings of a new spiritual awakening, a vast interreligious movement? This transformation might be what some hope would be a great turning toward a global community based on shared human connection, dedicated to the care of our planet, committed to justice and equity and seeks to raise hundreds of millions from poverty, violence, and oppression. I share the hopes of Diana Butler Bass. May this first source continue to keep our faith tradition alive. The second source, which reads, words and deeds of prophetic women and men, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil, with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love will be reflected on by Kathy Bain. Good morning. What is justice, and what do we in prophetic women and men say about it? Justice is what allows for all people to share equally in a healthy environment with freedom from unjust laws, unjust law enforcement, and unjust imprisonment freedom of control over our own bodies, freedom to participate fully in a true democracy, to pursue education, to benefit from one's own labor, pursue spiritual fulfillment and happiness. What is evil? Bad things happen when they're not necessarily evil. Evil is the intent to produce harm. Why do people do evil things? Alicia Garza says that most systems of impression aren't about bad people doing terrible things to people who are different from them, but instead they are a way of maintaining power for certain groups at the expense of others. So what do prophets say we can do about this? Dr. Martin Luther King says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Ijeoma Lewis says the beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself, and it's the only way forward. We can expand this to all forms of injustice. One does not have to be free of sin or imperfection. One has only to fight the good fight against injustice wherever we find it, including in ourselves. Resist weariness, cynicism, hopelessness, and the tendency to stop trying. We should never stop trying. We should never stop fighting for justice. Dr. Martin Luther King says none of us are free to all of us are free. Finally, a prophet says, I choose love. Everything I see is either an act of love or a call for love. I shine light upon the darkness, and I bring joy to the surface. Dropping drama and picking up love, I can again claim happiness and peace within. I choose to bring love to the situation that tempts me to follow fear. Love is my ultimate intention, so I choose to love and live in a loving world. Thank you. Venkat Raman will reflect on Hinduism as an example of Source 3, the wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. Thank you, Paul. I am honored to have this opportunity to say a few words to the congregation. I'll touch upon a few aspects of Hinduism and how they have shaped me to be who I am today. All things Hinduism are captured in our ultimate body of knowledge, the Vedas. Veda means knowledge in Sanskrit. Vedas are eternal. They have always existed and will always exist forever. Vedas are not teachings of a religious leader. Study of Vedas is beyond reach for most people. 
So to bring the messages to the masses, we have many stories, including the epics Ramayana and Mahabharata. These stories introduce many gods and goddesses with different persona, but there is only one god taking different forms. While these stories grabbed me and taught the underlying messages and teachings, two specific Hindu principles, the karmic cycle and the non-duality principle are responsible for my sense of right and wrong and also my empathy to fellow humans. Karmic cycle is a byproduct of karma, which introduces accountability for one's actions. Doing good deeds builds up your good karma or punya, and bad deeds accrue your bad karma or papa. You enjoy good things with your good karma and suffer bad things with your bad karma. The potent aspect of karmic consequence is that death does not stop you from experiencing the effects of your karma. You are born again and will pick up where you left off in your previous life in terms of discharging your karmic consequences. As you can imagine, this principle of karmic cycle is a powerful motivator for all Hindus to choose good deeds over bad. The principle of non-duality says that there is no difference between God and us. Every one of us is a form of God. Only we are controlled by Maya or illusion that makes us think we are all different. This principle has helped me develop empathy for others. Whenever I see something less than good in someone, I remind myself that there must be a reason in there that their inner self is not shining through in its full glory. I try to identify the reasons that influence their behavior. Often, this helps in diffusing the situation amicably. While there are several teachings from Hinduism that have made me who I am, I believe the two principles, the karmic cycle and the non-duality principle have been the most influential. With that, let me thank you, Paul, once again, for offering me this opportunity to speak a little about Hinduism as I understand it. Thank you. David Lefcourt will be reflecting on Judaism, part of the fourth source, which is the Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Doing this today really takes me back to my early grade school years. Being one of the three Jewish families in my class, I was often asked to take talk about my faith at an early age before I actually understood what any of it really meant or how the majority of people I would meet in life would be more concerned with our differences rather than our similarities and common beliefs, especially about morals and ethics. Judaism is the world's oldest surviving monotheistic religion, dating back nearly 4,000 years. It is one of the three Abrahamic religions, including Christianity and Islam. <clears throat> and in Judaism, Abraham is considered the father of Judaism, as well as the biological progenitor of the Jews. I won't flood you with all the history you can read the wiki page or history.com for that. This is to be a personal reflection, so I'll tell you what I learned at an early age about being a Jew. We were taught that Jews believed in one God and that we were the chosen people, and I really didn't know what that meant. But I was also told at that early age that King David was the king of the Jews and our religious symbol was the Star of David, or as I used to call it, the Star of Me. Quite a boost to a precocious, egocentric nine or ten year old, not knowing how or why someone might be persecuted for these beliefs until I eventually experienced it myself and then asked my teachers and parents for an explanation, and I learned a lot more from then on. Being chosen to be the people to create a nation of pe peoples that do what is just and compassionate has the same egotistic problem that I had as a child named David. But the goal is common, 
The morality stories from the Bible, the Torah, the Old Testament, all teach us the basics of being a good person, how to give charity without pride, to do unto others as we'd have done to ourselves. One's, one God's aspiration, whether through Jesus, the Jewish people, is to teach us to do what is tr just and compassionate, to do the right thing, all leading to a, a very humanistic approach to religion in general. With all the different gods, the rules, the laws, the dogma put aside, that really just takes us down to the basic of being a good person, doing the right thing, and being good to others. So that'll take us on to our sixth source. Thank you. I will be reflecting myself on the fifth source, which is humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. Humanism is not a narrowly defined belief, but a broad concept. It is said that it was initiated when the ancient Greek philosopher Protagoras proclaimed, man is the measure of all things. I trace it further back, at least to the Hebrew prophet Amos who wrote, I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, but let justice roll down like waters. It was enlarged by the Greek naturalistic philosopher Epicurus, the first to admit women as well as men to his school, and the Roman Lucretius, who put the science of Epicurus into poetry. Humanism was advanced when Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And when Paul the Apostle wrote, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Roman Boethus spoke humanism with Man is so constituted that he then only excels other things when he knows himself. But he was followed by people most concerned about human relationship with church and with monarch or feudal lord. The humanist spirit began to revive when Byzantine historian Anna Komnena wrote of the need to appeal to the evidence of actual events and of eyewitnesses and when Eleanor of Aquitaine proclaimed courtly love for respectful relationships of humans to humans. Humanism looks outward with Rene Descartes, who wrote, it is well to know something of the manners of various peoples in order more sanely to judge our own. It accepts Copernicus' discovery that we are not at the center of the universe, and Einstein's discovery that there is no center of the universe, it acknowledges that we are part of nature, with Newton's discovery that the same laws of physics apply to people, to apples, to moon, and planets. Humanism incorporates the discovery of Lamarck and Wallace and Darwin that all people, black or white or other, are sisters and brothers, that monkeys are our cousins, and even that we are distantly related to bacteria. The humanist spirit has faith, as when Anne Frank wrote in her diary, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. It has hope, as when Daganawida proclaimed, thinking will replace killing. It has love, as when Nelson Mandela said, man's goodness is a flame that can be hidden but never extinguished. Finally, just as humanism is not strictly defined, it is also not complete. With Francis Bacon, we proclaim, let man endeavor an endless progress. Finally, reflecting on the sixth source will be Shauna Pickett Gordon, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. Hello, I'm Shauna Pickett-Gordon. In Wicca, which is one of the neo-pagan earth-centered religions and my own chosen spiritual path, we tend to think in circles. By that I don't mean that we indulge in circular thinking, although that can happen to anybody. 
But the flat linear constructs of patriarchal religion with beliefs predefined and life choices barely negotiable, with all ears tuned to the central voice of authority, with human history filtered through a straight and narrow worldview, that just doesn't cut it for pagans. Life is far more complex than that. Maybe the way to any useful answer is a not so straight path through questions and then deeper questions and through finding connections. Unitarian Universalism's sixth source is described as spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. This appeals to my sense that truth can be better sought in non-linear forms. Now, living in harmony with the rhythms of nature, that is a toughie, especially just now. Nature is changing even as we watch. Right, science has already told us we're a prime cause of that. What we have done has triggered climate change or to call the situation what it really is, climate crisis. Knowing our role in that just complicates our choices. Returning to the rhythms of nature means mental and spiritual exploration using the equality of the circle gathering, being democratic about inclusion, passing the talking stick perhaps, constantly spiraling to the center and back out again into the world in our spiritual and mental exploration, taking the winding way as we do when walking the labyrinth. In that quest, we also meet possibilities that may not be the answer but need to be explored or considered before returning to the main path. So in a way, this sacred circle also resembles a maze with its dead ends, its mysteries, its hanging questions, and its eternal potential for reaching the goal, finding the way out. I find it a comfort that there are so many diverse Earth-centered traditions to learn from on our journey back to a harmony in with nature. And it's wonderful that Unitarian Universalism embraces those traditions. I wish to thank you all, Reverend Barbara Myers, Kathy Bain, and David Lefcourt of our congregation, and friends Venkat Raman and Shauna Pickett Gordon for joining with me to illustrate the varied sources which Unitarian Universalism draws on. I found each of your reflections inspiring as I received them and incorporated them into this service. Thank you. Please join with me in to read the words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We are blessed with many sources. Let us accept truth and love wherever they are found. Go in peace, return in love.